Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sacramento Dugout Show. I'm Todd Sullivan. I'm here with my co-host Dante Morris. Uh, we have a very special guest today, 1993 Major League draftee, uh, played for 10 years in Major League Baseball, Mr. Matt Walbeck. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure, Todd. Hey. Dante. You were last year inducted into the Sacramento Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, that's coming up again this year. But more importantly, well, the reason why I have you on the show is uh, I want to talk high school and ac academy baseball. Um, a lot of the kids that are coming out to my clinics on Sunday, they're asking me a, a lot of different type of questions that are going on. How can I be seen? What is a showcase? And it made me think a little bit. And when I was going back to all the academies in the baseball and what I see going on, I actually, the first thing that popped me is Matt. You know, I've, I see Matt, he takes his kids out to college days uh, so they can go out and not only see the campus but play on beautiful baseball fields. But it's so nice to see how involved you are with your academy and one-on-one -on -one individual involvement with your kids. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's one of the things that we really practice in the summertime is to get our kids seen by college coaches and recruiters. Um, and basically, I call up the colleges. For instance, we went out to Sac State. UOP, William Jessup, St. Mary's, uh, University of San, uh, San Francisco, and San Francisco State, just to get the kids an opportunity to be around the coaches, see what it's like to play on the field, and then get a campus tour. Right. And um, it's just a great opportunity for them to get out and perform in front of recruiters. Yeah, a lot of kids, they hear that, that showcase or recruiting or something like that, and they become very stiff, very nervous. They don't want to make mistakes. But what I see them, I see your kids are out there very loose, very lively. And I just think it reflects on you, on how you take that nervousness away from them. You put them in that environment that they're comfortable with, like if they're at your academy and it's just a normal practice routine get together because they were so loose and they were all seemed to be having a lot of fun and the coaches that I saw out there from the universities were actually communicating and talking with each other and most of those guys are normally talking with you or just walking around so I can see a huge difference when the Wallback Academy goes out to visit a college. Oh well thank you yeah and um, one of the things that we try to do is actually get the kids to play um, in talking to some of the college recruiters and coaches that I know they they have a tendency to to say that some of the kids are just toolsy and they don't know how to play the game. So they, they can throw hard and they can hit it really fast, but they don't know how to play the game. They don't know how to line up for cuts and relays. They don't know how to run a proper bunt defense and things like that. And so that's why we want them to actually play and perform. So what we'll do is we'll take a batting practice, infield and outfield, and uh, of course they'll warm up before that. And then we'll just play a, an inner squad amongst each other. And uh, a pitcher may face six batters. And we may have a 1-1 one, one count. Nice. Um, not an umpire out there, but a coach will be out there calling balls and strikes just to give them a chance to, to get that experience and actually perform and, and play and not just go out and show how fast you can throw or, right. or run. And that that like lightens that. the things up. Yeah. Really. So when you take a group of kids out, is it a, a team like a U17, a U16, or is it like class of 22, class of 20, class of 19? How do you, how do you uh, separate your groups? By class. class. Yes. So we have class. Uh, our, in fact, we have a school, a baseball school at Walbeck Baseball. Academy. Uh, we start them as young as five years old right. and um, we build them all the way up in their graduating class and teach them fundamentals that are appropriate for their age and also for the season. So what a six-year-old might be learning in the spring is different than what a 15-year-old would be practicing. So we're building a curriculum and we want to make it healthy and certainly kids need to play other sports too and and first of all they need to get good grades. So right. that's one of the things that the college recruiters always say first is mm -hmm. number one is your grades. You have to have a certain grade point average to even step foot on this field. So if you're a 2.5 or lower, you know, this isn't going to be the place for you. So that as well as the SAT. So the kids need to really bear down in the classroom, focus on their fundamentals and just be good kids. That's Jeez. nice because the 2.5 and you need 2.0 to play in high school. 2.5 yeah. is really where it should be at. Really, it should be 3.5. <laughs> three five. Yeah, or 4.0. I mean, yeah. if you want to play at a high level, you need to have a 3.5 to a 4.0 like and a 1,300 on your SAT and there be you able go. to play good baseball. There you go. Do you see like a big difference? Uh, we mentioned that you go by class. Like, say, five-year-olds, do you see a big difference of them guys sticking together all the way to 12 as opposed to guys that's coming in at kind of like all everywhere? Like, what's the biggest difference you see from a class that, you know, start maybe five or six together and they play on the same team at 13, 14? Well, you know, this is really our, our 
second year when we're moving into this model. Um, mm -hmm. Before we just would train kids and put teams together. Uh -huh. And so I think the longer that kids play together, the, yeah. the more polished they're gonna be. They're gonna know how to hold runners better. Uh, they're gonna know what pitch to call when and that sort of thing. Certainly just like a, a music band or any kind of team, the longer right. you play together, the better you're gonna play. Yeah. Um, but I think the big thing, the most important thing is just to teach kids the proper fundamentals at the right time in their stage of development. No yeah. different than when Absolutely. you're learning math. You know, you have to go through steps, building blocks of a curriculum in math or any school and certainly in sports too. Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna start teaching five-year-olds how to throw curve balls yet. In fact, we're not even gonna teach them to really get in front of the ball. We just want them to catch the ball. Yeah. We wanna teach them how to hold the ball. Now when you're 16 years old, that's completely different. You have to be able to have backhands, extended backhands. You need to be able to mix your pitches, mm -hmm. start hitters off with off speed and throw strikes two out of three of uh, the first pitches. So all that comes down to development at the right time and the right phase. One of the things I like too is um, you mentioned earlier that you actually you know get them to play. Uh, I know like coming up, you know, me playing baseball, it's, it's a lot of pressure, you know, from your parents and your family. Everybody want their kid to be the best. Everybody want them to get a one leg up, but you know it could get real tiring if you just go take batting practice every day. You're just doing drills and you're just training. Like I actually have fun when I play in the game situation. You know, when it's one on one count. Our three two only got one pitch to hit, so that's one thing that I kind of like about your program that you actually get them out there to actually play the game because you know going through practice every day, you know, it's good. It's you learning the fundamentals, but you actually got to learn during game time, and you know, it's nothing like that game time experience, that game time situation. So, as opposed to that, what else separates your program um, from other programs out there? Well, um, yeah, and talking about the competition at practice, uh, we always, as part of our practice plan, we always end it with some live play competition nice. just to get them to compete. But I think what separates us is just the organization, the structure, um, the discipline, and the respect and grace for the parents and the kids and understanding that it's a hard game. I mean, that's why they call it hardball. Yeah. It's very humbling. And so if we focus on our controllables and, and there's so much out of our control in baseball, whether it's the weather, the umpire, the coach's decisions, but if we can just focus on being on time and hustling mm -hmm. and just making the routine play and being a good teammate, the rest will take care of itself. Because quite frankly, most of the people that end up not making it, they, they just show up late. Right. They don't try hard enough. You know, they don't put in the effort that it takes. And we even give our kids homework, things that we recommend that they practice nice. at home because I mean, they can come to our academy as much as they want, but really they're gonna be better when they're at home and they decide in five minutes they're gonna bust out some push-ups and yeah. work on their stride or maybe to work on some balance points at home. It really comes from within to be a great baseball player or a successful business person. And I, I think too, part of his your successful in business is you, a lot of the the kids, I, I call them because I'm younger, that you have actually your coaches that are helping yeah. you, they went through your program you know, they learned your philosophies, they went on minor leagues, they went on through college, and then they, they came back, and they're still teaching your philosophies. I think it's, 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 a, it's more of a family atmosphere. Everybody that is involved coaching-wise, regardless of the age group, they, they know your process, they know your plan, and everybody's on 100%. And it really, to me, you can tell that, you know, the people there care because they were young once, you showed, you showed what they had, you showed belief into them, you gave them a, a place to go and they come back and now they're here helping you. Yeah, it's great. We do have a, a different levels of coaches ages. Um, Paul Moeller has been with us the longest. Um, he's been with us for going on six years now. Uh, Jerry Nielsen's a former major league pitcher. He's been trained. He's been working with us for several years as well as Joey Wagner. Um, and we have uh, Tim McGann and Patrick Reynoso in there training with us. But we also have high school players that help us out in clinics and even some 13 and 14 year old kids that are just about ready to get into high school that help us with Little League clinics too. So we have the full range of yep. coaching and each of those coaches have their role and um, again, lead by example. That's what it's all about. And then, and then you also, every now and then you have a great former Major League Baseball player, a good friend of ours. He's from played at Christian Brothers, you have Andy Fox, oh, Every, he'll Andy's come great. in and he'll do a middle infield drill. So you're always getting you know, great people coming out to teach the that skills. That too, yeah, and Andy Fox has been a, a very good friend of mine and we've trained together as players and he does our infield clinic. Um, and so he's gonna do that again this year. Yeah. And yeah, we're looking and forward when to it, when, it, when is that so people can know? That is on uh, November the 6th and that's gonna be at our baseball academy. Um, last year we had JT Snow come out and do a hitting presentation and I do a catching clinic. and. So we try to keep that going too, bring in the pros. And that's exactly what I'd like to talk about. I want to talk catching and pitching. Great. And we'll do that right after these messages. All right.
right, and welcome back. Okay, now that we're back, I, in my clinics, I have a lot, I, I do, I have a pitching clinic, you know, Perfect Game Pitching Solutions, but I've been having a lot of catchers come out, which is great, because I need catchers, plus catchers and pitchers communication and how important it is. Um, I have a, a couple of kids, they just think I'm throwing to you squat, sit down, squat. I'm like, let's don't waste time here. If we're gonna work on four seam, two seam, let's have the catcher set up properly for our four seam. Where are we gonna work that four seam? And let's set up that two seam. Let's communicate, let's work this out. And the kids just go back to playing catch. So mm -hmm. please tell me, as a Major League Baseball catcher, the communication from catcher to pitcher, and as far, I'm, I'm the pitcher, but I know that the catcher's my boss. Yeah, no. Because <laughs> the catcher is going to help me out the most. What are you looking for the pitcher to make your job easy? Well, um, I learned a lot of this, if not most of it, from Mike Sosha, who uh, was my manager in Anaheim, and he taught us a lot about the pitcher catcher relationship. Number one, you, you got to get to know your pitcher and um, find out what type of personality he has. Uh, sitting next to him in the dugout is a big thing in between innings, um, talking to him before the game about game plans. Uh, understanding what his best pitch is, what his second best and his third and fourth best pitches are, being able to rank those um, at a 30,000 foot level and then also on the day of the game. What he has in the bullpen may not necessarily translate to what he has in the game. Right. So you have to make sure that even in warm-ups before the game and in between innings that he's given it his all. There can be no half-speed pitches. Every pitch matters. Um, and then from that point, understanding how to set your target up for a pitcher does matter. So for one pitcher, I may want to have my target up here. For another pitcher, I may want to even turn my glove over this way or here. You have to have an idea of where they want you to set up and when you want, they want you to move. Um, and other than that, understanding that if they bounce the ball, you got to block it. You have to keep everything in front of you. And um, I mean, there's a lot that goes to it, but just knowing what makes them tick. In fact, I play men's league right now. I had about a 20 minute conversation with our pitcher that's pitching tomorrow, coming up with a game plan for him and just letting him know, okay, this is what I want us to do. This is how I want you to do this with your delivery. You need to slow down a little bit. Um, we need to have a little more time in between your, your set and you got to pick me up before you deliver. So just being a pitching coach as a catcher is a big thing. Being a catcher, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, me playing little league, playing high school, even playing as an adult, being a catcher, that's like a hard thing to do. Like you got some pitchers that, you know, you're two feet away, I want to throw a 90,000 miles per hour at you. You got to be able to pick that up. Ball hit the dirt. You got to have like sore thighs all the time. What makes you really want to stick with being a catcher? Like what attracts you to, you know, staying with that position and taking it all the way up to the major league level? Well, um, I didn't have range to play any other position. And um, I loved being able to see the whole field, uh -huh. being able to communicate with the umpire, take the manager's uh, plan and the pitching coach's plan and use that in the game. Uh, I like being a field general. Um, the pain didn't really bother me because when I put my uniform on, that seemed to kind of go away. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had really good hands and feet and I could throw and I threw guys out and I, they bounce it, I'd block it, I'd present pitch as well, you know, and just that whole communication like Todd was talking about with that pitcher catcher relationship, I really like that. Um, getting the most out of him. So I feel like I'm here to serve right. my pitchers. Exactly. Whatever I can do to help you, it's all about you. And um, there's nothing better when you get a pitcher that you're catching when you can actually read his mind and know what he wants to throw. And almost like he's anticipating every pitch that you call. Yes, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> yeah. And that's the ultimate goal. So the game actually manages, manages itself. Mm -hmm. And the game calling just happens through that bond and relationship we have with each other. I just, okay. that's the part I really like. Well, you, you even managed in the, in the minor leagues with Western Michigan Whitecaps mm -hmm. and some other teams, but it, as the catcher, you're involved with every pitch. You know you're going to be involved and you're going to catch a pitch. But what, what I seem to notice, the pitcher, he's in the dugout. It's every five days as a professional. High school, you're probably going to, you know, you're pitching against the better teams. Uh, and, and the coach already had you blocked out when you're going to pitch. But the, the catcher's out there every play. He sees the hitters. He, he starts to understand their hands. You know, you have the coach that is coaching. The coach is going to call, call, call a certain pitch. But as a catcher, you're being developed on every position, even though you're just the catcher and the hitter. So mm -hmm. you're, it's important for you to see their hands and you're actually making adjustments just by watching the guy swing. Oh, yeah. How do you communicate that to your pitcher? Um, by the pitch that I call. Yeah. Um, but there's something to be said about focusing more on your pitcher's strengths than the batter's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I got in trouble a few times calling the wrong pitch in the big leagues because I was going to attack the hitter's weakness when I should have just gone with my pitcher's strengths. Mm -hmm. But there's also that moment of magic as a catcher when you can see the hitter move his feet mm -hmm. just a little bit differently. And he's basically telling you, I'm looking for this now or right. that. And so now <laughs> I put that into the bank and that will help me make a decision in a, in a call that I make. And if a guy fouls off a bunch of pitches as a hitter, uh, one after another after another, uh, I'll call timeout and go out and talk to the pitcher and give him a little break. And sometimes I've even told the hitter what's coming uh -huh. just to make him think about it. Because if he fouls off 13 pitches, it's just two minutes. I'm just like, here comes a fastball. Just get it over with, you know, <laughs> already. And they're like, is he telling me the truth? <laughs> and then head. one time we, we uh, faced Edgar Martinez and Ichiro with the Mariners. Mm -hmm. And we'd have these pregame meetings about how we were going to attack them and this and that. And I just raised my hand. I said, no, no, no. I said, Edgar Martinez, there's only one pitch he can't hit. And they go, what's that? I go, a fastball right down the middle. <laughs> you throw him something on the corner, a nasty slider, he's going to rake it. But he doesn't know what to do with that fastball down the middle. He never sees it. So then that just kind of made everybody loosen right. up. And sure enough, they'd throw a fastball right down the middle and he'd pop it up, you know, or hit a one hopper right. to the shortstop. And so sometimes you just got to go at him with just your best stuff and hope they hit it at somebody. And catcher's instincts, that's why catchers make best managers. <laughs> so what's the best feeling? Because, uh, you know, me, I play center field, I play shortstop. I like throwing somebody out. What's a better feeling out of throwing like a, a really good runner out at second or just hitting a bomb? Uh, throwing a guy out to end the inning. Oh yeah, okay. Is is a great feeling. When you hose a guy and he's out and you get to run off the field, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a pretty special feeling. I was fortunate enough to catch a no hitter in the big leagues too. I caught Scott Erickson's no hitter in ninety four. That was probably my career highlight. But that feeling of throwing a runner out, a real fast runner, is is just a wonderful feeling. And since we're still talking about catching, you know, back to my clinics with the catchers out there, you know, they were asking me once again, oh, I got this showcase coming up. What about my pop time? Where's my pop time at? And I go, well, let me see. And I don't talk about the 2.2 seconds or the 2.0 seconds. I'm talking, it's your feet. We got to mm -hmm. start from the ground up. And they're like, no, I need to get 1.9. I need to get 1.8. And I'm like, no, no, no. We first need to start from the ground. Please explain the pop time. Yes, it's all about the time on the stopwatch. Mm -hmm. But what actually is and how is a proper pop time affected? Um, it, is, it starts from the ground up. And I think a lot of times kids try to gain ground with their feet. They try to rush out to get it. And that's not realistic because there's a hitter there. A lot of times they, they don't practice with a hitter, so they're cheating themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have the footwork match the exchange of the ball and your glove to your release point. And one of the things I see with a lot of younger catchers and high school players in particular is they have a tendency to take their, the ball when they catch it and bring the ball to their ear, which allows for very little glove ball separation because the feet have to move a certain distance. This part has to match it. So the best way to teach it, in my opinion, is to get that right foot slightly back and staggered and move it just a little bit this way so the front foot can go towards second and always separate from the center of the body this way. So even if the pitch is up here, you catch it, bring it to the center of your body and separate. If it's over here, separate that way. Also, don't play to the clock, play to targets. You wanna throw that ball low, about knee high, right over the base. And if you have to bounce it, you bounce it. Um, and then the last thing I, I talk about is just letting the ball turn you. So instead of trying to go get it, you let the ball hit your mitt and let everything else after that follow. So practice, practice, practice. practice, practice. Yeah. yeah. It's a hard drill. Uh, I mean, it's a hard position for a young person to 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 play uh, because they're, from what I see, is they're back there trying to catch the ball. They're trying to frame the ball. They're trying to be uh, totally perfect, which mm -hmm. creates stiffness. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also creates a blocking of the umpire. Mm -hmm. What would you say would be for somebody at a high school level a proper setup for for a catcher? Always stay under the ball. So if you, you don't want anything to go under you. So the, at the idea has to be, I'm looking below the ball. It's much easier for me to go up than it is to go down. Right. And I want my pitchers to concentrate on throwing the ball down in the zone. Because once they get the ball down, they get that angle and it's much harder for the hitter to see it and they get more swings and more ground balls. Um, but staying under the ball and trying to catch it in this part of the hand is big. And actually relaxing the wrist in this position before you go to catch the ball is, is somewhat beneficial too. Um, always tuck that right thumb because if the thumb's exposed, you'll get a, a broken I finger. I just had a whole bunch of 
kids cringe because I always talk about tuck. And yeah, then. you got to <laughs> tuck the thumb and, and juggle, jump rope, and a lot of hand-eye coordination things really help. Uh, catching tennis balls is good yeah. for coaches to do too because it's, it's hard to feel, and once you get the hard ball that sticks in there. Uh, catching's the best position out there by far. If you, if you have any kids out there and you want them to go pro or college, put them behind the plate. But the problem is you got to love it back there. You can't just, you can't be a guy that doesn't, nah, I don't really know if I want to catch. No, you got to want to catch all the time to be a good one. Yeah. That's true. And, you know, once again, Matt, I really appreciate you being on our show. And the reason why I keep pulling you back is because the Wallbeck Academy is a special academy. It does a lot of things out there that most academies don't do. And I can, for a fact, say that you are there for the kid from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Uh, and and it, it's very, uh, it's amazing on what your facility does. And uh, don't go anywhere because we're going to bring Dan back. Cool. And we're going to hit our famous hot corner. All right, guys, and we're back. Uh, this is the famous hot corner. We're going to talk about different hot button topics that kind of, you know, get people's opinions going. First, want to start off, and anybody can take it from the table. What do you guys think is the best era of baseball? You know, we have all type of eras, all different type of styles, but, you know, which one is pinned as the best? Anybody can start. Well, I, you know, I'm an oldies fanatic. You know, I'm, I, even though I wasn't alive when Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig played, I was always fascinated with that era. You okay. know, I mean, uh, they didn't have the best equipment in the world, um, but they were, you know, they were great ball players. Um, you know, they, um, it, it just seemed like a, a more simpler time, you know, and uh, that, that would probably be my, my uh, era right there. Okay. For me, uh, because my baseball days were more with my grandfather and my mother and father, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 70s is when they really had day games. So we were able to go to baseball mm -hmm. more when there were day games. Uh, so back in the 70s, to me, it, baseball was seeing a, a daytime game with my family, with my grandfather, watching my grandfather keep a scorebook, you know, and learning how to track pitches, so to speak, trying to figure out what my grandfather did. But, you know, daytime baseball to me is really what I grew up on. Same, yeah. I'm more of a 70s fan, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, doubleheaders, Monday night baseball, and, yeah. uh, you know, just the back in school, our teacher would have the World Series games on, <laughs> and the Yankees, or playoffs, and the Yankees and the Red Sox were going at it. So I, I really like that period, too. And for me, I'll say the 90s, you know, you got the Oakland A's, that was powerhouse. You had Ken Griffey really coming to start him, you know. I was right-handed, but I batted with the Ken Griffey <laughs> little hesitation. And uh, you know, grow, growing up in Oakland, you know, seeing the Mark McGuire, Terry Steinbeck, like all them Oakland A's, I was kind of like really stars, you know. So I'll say the '90s was kind of like a good little topic. So being that you know, you, that's you're the youngest on the staff, and you you pick the '90s era of baseball, and you're leaning towards those Oakland A's. Uh, it was it that style of baseball bash brother type style that that interest you or because back then that's still when small ball was being played in the yeah. National League <laughs> which was true baseball so was yeah. it the the home run that got got you going on it or I think in the 90s you really established stars like you knew who Ken Griffey was he could walk down the street and you could recognize him you knew who the bash brother was like you kind of knew who stars was like in the 90s I say if you look nowadays Everybody, like, you got Mike Trout, and you might not recognize him if you're in Safeway or something. Right. So you could really recognize, I think baseball did a good job at marketing their stars, and it really identified me, you know, just looking on TV, looking at the stars, looking at the different batting cards, and I could say, I want to be like Griffey, or I want to be like Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa, and I could really identify them. So that's kind of really what drew it to me, just the star power that was bigger than life. They grew up playing. You could you know, see their stats everywhere. You could see their style. And we went out there to play baseball. We try to imitate them. So I just think that stardom is really what grabbed me. And that's why I really love baseball, just because of what I saw on TV and saw how they play. Oh, well, you guys, we really appreciate you being on the show. Matt, you Thanks, know, Dan, Doc. thank you very much. And thank hey, so much. Uh, don't, don't forget, take. October 13th, uh, Christian Brothers High School is going to be the LaSalle uh, Sacramento Area Baseball Hall of Fame inductees. Dan will be there. I know both you guys, you already got your jacket. Yep. yep. Uh, you'll be getting your jacket coming up soon. And hey,
congratulations Thanks. to both of you, Matt. Thanks. Thank you once again for being on the show and giving us the experience that you had and looking forward to seeing you on the 13th. You so thank you once again and good night. Great.